So uh, my name is Adam Tews of Columbia University, uh, and it's my extraordinary pleasure, really, to welcome you to this panel uh, this evening. Uh, I think you, I, it barely needs uh, stressing from my side uh, what a privilege it is to listen uh, to the folks that we have here. Um, briefly, of course, we have uh, Kuroda, uh, the governor of the Bank of Japan, uh, welcome. Uh, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England. Cecilia Skingsley of the Swedish Central Bank, uh, Charles Lee, CEO of the Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing, and uh, David Lipton, first Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. We, between us, must at the front here have decades of experience in the <laughs> financial markets, in banking, and in central banking altogether. And our theme this evening is going to be the future of financial regulation, uh, financial governance uh, in the turbulent times that we face, both from the point of view of macroeconomics uh, the markets, uh, and from the political and geopolitical environment that has been the subject of so much discussion at Davos this year. The format we're going to use is that that we use whenever we have such a panel, such a heavyweight panel and so little time, which we will drive this through discussion through a series of questions, uh, and we will move as quickly as possible uh, to uh, the floor so as uh, you may uh, have the chance to ask questions yourselves and make best use of this time. The question I thought that we would start with, and I thought I would start by asking the central bankers, and perhaps in order of sequence from the left-hand side towards the center, is the, question <laughs> of, uh, is the question of where you see the financial system 10 years on from the shock of 2008, and its resilience and its stability, potential vulnerabilities to shocks, how you, of course, this is a conditional on your estimation of what shocks we might realistically expect to face. Mm -hmm. But just your take on that balance of probabilities. Because as we all know, forecasts of GDP have moderated. But above all, the international agencies have been adding a larger risk component uh, to their assessments. How does it look from the central banking point of view? Well, I think the best way to maintain resilience is to uh, protect what we have actually achieved. It's important to remember that under the G20 agenda, under the excellent chairing of, of Governor Carney and the FSB, we now have larger capital in banks, liquidity buffers in banks. We have special regulations handling too big to fail problems. Uh, we have handled the uh, counterparty risks in, in derivatives, regulations for resolutions, etc. So um, I think my first message is we should be very careful to maintain what we have achieved in these areas because there is already a lot of creativity and energy going in to, in different ways, trying to dilute these reforms. And uh, if we think it's noisy already today, wait until we get a global downturn and these uh, voices will be very noisy. So I think we should try to agree that the best way to ha handle or avoid the next crisis remember the last one and, uh, and remember and protect what we, we have achieved. And if I might press you on, the, on what you've just said, the we, who, the we that should hang on. Is there a, <laughs> what is the community that, that you're appealing to? I, I, think, I mean, I, there, there is always details in a reform uh, that can be discussed. I, I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I get personally concerned when I hear uh, a lot of energy being put into trying to dilute regulations that are already that has not yet been put in place. It's a very slow, it's a very slow uh, process of, of executing these, and and try to tear them apart already would would definitely be the wrong way to to go. Governor Carney, um, a couple of quick comments. <coughs> One pick up where Cecilia left off, uh, which is that you know. Uh, memories are short in, uh, in finance, uh, financial lobbies are powerful, and success is an orphan uh, mm. in financial stability. The more successful we are, the more people forget about uh, what can happen. Um, so <laughs> complacency is a danger. And uh, uh, Now, that said, I, I, I absolutely agree. The core of the uh, financial system, the banking sector, has been transformed. Mm. I can give you lots of stats with very large multiples uh, to prove that, but since we're on ping pong, I'll, I'll, I won't. Mm. Happy to provide them if anyone uh, takes the other side of that. Half of the system, though, now is market-based finance. Mm -hmm. And we should have a chance to talk about that and what that could mean. That's both good and potentially create some new risks. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I'd say is that uh, what we have tried to do, and I'll finish with this point, is to plan for failure uh, in two ways. One, 
ending too big to fail. We're in a process to end too big to fail, having bailable mm -hmm. debt. Uh, that hasn't really been tested on at scale. Um, and there's supposed to be incentives that are driven by those debt holders as well. It's not just that they provide other capital, but they should know that they have skin in the game, and that should help discipline. Not yet tested, has to be seen through. The other form of failure that we need to plan for is around operational risk and cyber. Um, obviously, huge effort has to be made to make the system more resilient. It's being made. But you've got to look at these situations and say, at some point, some core service or institution might be down for a while, and what is the system going to do about it? Uh, that's an area where we need to do a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Governor Kurt. Yeah. Um, the global financial crisis uh, started uh, around 2008. Um, basically <coughs> emanated from the US and Europe. Uh, the Japanese financial system uh, was not much affected, but still we uh, strongly support the work of FSB as well as the Basel Committee to substantially strengthen financial regulation over uh, particularly commercial banks and also some others. And uh, already uh, strengthening uh, capital requirements, uh, strengthening liquidity management, derivative transaction, uh, too big to fail, and so on and so forth. Those are, are already agreed upon, and the Basel three has been already finalized. But uh, not all items of uh, Basel three and so on and so forth have been uh, implemented. Mm -hmm. Some are going to be implemented in coming years. So at this stage, as she emphasized, uh, no need to dilute the agreement, but rather we uh, carefully monitor how all members of the Basel Committee, all members of, uh, of, of FSB, as well as uh, others, uh, implement in a timely manner. That is the most important. Uh, at this stage. Of course, uh, the Barras Committee will uh, evaluate uh, if there is any side effect of uh, uh, items uh, of regulation. Of course, uh, they are prepared to uh, discuss uh, any necessary ad adjustment. But really, I think uh, the most important is to implement in a timely manner and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, look uh, at carefully if anything uh, uh, negative uh, uh, side effect uh, are coming from the new regulations. And uh, Mark mentioned the cyber risk. I think this is going to be the most uh, significant risk uh, faced by the financial system, not just banks, but non-banks and, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so in coming years, probably this uh, cyber risk uh, issue would be the most uh, serious kind of risk. And uh, we have to uh, uh, carefully uh, study and uh, think about uh, ways to uh, strengthen the system against any cyber attack. I want to come back to both the market-based mm. finance and the cyber yeah, point yeah. in a minute, but maybe from the point of view of the IMF, David Lipton, how do you evaluate as a sort of contrasting point of view, perhaps, mm. of the central banks, the situation in the global finance? No, I agree with what's been <coughs> said. Mm. I think uh, a lot's been accomplished, and the um, changes that have been made really uh, help uh, protect our financial system. It's important that there not be backtracking. I think we do, as has been suggested, need to look at uh, the broader uh, perimeter of new activities that have not uh, uh, caused problems in the past, but where risk may be migrating in the non-bank sector. Uh, I think we also need to uh, use some of the tools that have been 
developed but haven't really necessarily all been tried out, macroprudential tools mm. to mm. see what's useful and could, could uh, supplement and in a sense support the reforms mm. that have been done. Mm. And as Kordasan has said, I think even more broadly than cyber, uh, we need to be thinking about how technological innovations uh, may um, uh, change the landscape a bit and uh, require some adjustment uh, to the way we look at things, either the perimeter of including, uh, you know, regulating some of the new financial technologies uh, according, not according to entity, but according to what kinds of banking or financial activities and financial risks that they may uh, 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 bring up. And I think to some extent we need to look outside of the financial sector to see whether there could be problems brewing, say, in uh, the area of, of uh, corporate debt mm -hmm. in some places or in some pockets in some places that might um, feed back. I, I recall that, uh, you know, if you, co if you think back to LTCM days, the idea uh, was let's not regulate hedge funds. Let's um, take a look at how, at the banks that lend to hedge funds and um, uh, we, don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to think about the individual companies. And of course, uh, the hedge funds didn't end up being the problem, but rather banks were doing all sorts of other things yes. uh, that ended up uh, being the problem. But you know, we need to look at, uh, to make sure we understand the, the um, leverage, the maturity transformation, the liquidity transformation that's going on elsewhere in the financial system and uh, whether there, there, there could be problems that come back mm. uh, to uh, uh, asset management companies or if the risks have really now reside with uh, the investors, mm. uh, to the investors and in some, with some dynamic that could be problematic. We, 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 you know, this may not be for bank regulators. This may be something that in the end of the day is a broader uh, issue about uh, the financial system, but I think we need to um, make sure we're not fighting the last war, but rather looking at the landscape we, we face. Thank you. Ch Charles Lee, you, you obviously now coming at these problems from the question really of the equity markets. Before that, however, you had a very distinguished career in banking, mm. and obviously from Hong Kong you have a privileged vantage point on one of the banking landscapes that is most on everyone's mind, namely the Chinese banking landscape. Do you, do you share the, the overall sanguine viewpoint that we've, that we've had expressed so far? Uh, yes, um, but you know, I'm much more looking from a China perspective. Just think about 10 years ago what China did and what China is faced today. I mean, essentially, 10 years ago when confidence was completely evaporating around the globe and China decided to pluck the hole and uh, put a lot of burden on its shoulders and essentially a full trillion renminbi mm. flooding into its own market, essentially sending a signal that, okay, we're going to be at least plotting that hole, and we're going to import all that problems. So I think uh, that was a great uh, you know, uh, act of uh, contribution. But that presented with China, or left China, with two big problems uh, and that has been brewing over 10 years. Mm. Essentially, that full trillion was flooded into the economy when China did not really have any real efficient allocation system for that money to really find the right place. So a lot of that, and a lot of people would say the bulk of it, have essentially found them into the wrong place, creating overcapacity into the SOEs, into the least productive sector. So that issue need to be somehow resolved, number one. Number two, with that sort of a massive input and creating this internal big bloated body China needs desperately in the future find ways to have transition exchanges, you know, get its own capital outside into more productive areas mm. so that the Chinese can find ways to diversify and also absorb new capitals that can help China to direct the internal capital into where it's the most productive sector. Mm. So now China find 10 years later that uh, having become part of a team solving a big problem and having two problems to solve now and, uh, and uh, the partners are not interested anymore or the partners start <laughs> to say, ah, we don't like you anymore. <laughs> um, you know, I know 10 years later, you know, you stand up for the family, but today we want a divorce. 
<laughs> so now how to deal with that issue is becoming very important. But ironically, I think on that issue about internal allocation, more efficient allocation, the right allocation, the me mechanism, ironically, China may have found a different way of doing it through fintech, which is a solution. On the, inter on the capital, in and out, I think they found Hong Kong as a, another place mm. to solve that problem. So, but I thought the questions are now on problems. Mm. So on that two solutions, whenever I have a chance to yeah. come back, I will talk about that. <laughs> well, this is, this, is a, this is a fascinating angle, and I'd like if you don't mind to just deepen it a little bit. Um, because you'll be, you'll be, I wonder, as a historian, I wonder whether the sort of workout that we saw in China in the late 1990s and the early 2000s is something that is now completely off the cards. That was also, of course, something that involved, in the end, international capital, international banking, uh, in the final phases of that in the, uh, the, the first years of the new millennium. Is that, is that kind of a vision just completely unthinkable at this, at this stage? No, I think China, whether by design or probably by reality, mm. uh, has developed into a bipolar uh, system. On the one hand, on the banking side, largely SOE banks, their liability side of the balance sheet is so strong right. because uh, essentially there is a sovereign guarantee on that balance <laughs> sheet. So as a result, depositors put money into the Chinese banking system and never had any issues, will never do a run on the bank no matter what happens. So <laughs> the banks can just continue to screw up for five years, and then eventually something will work out. The economy grows and things get worked out. Because as long as there's no run on the bank, liquidity is not a problem, those issues get resolved. But that, on the other hand, still did not really give the bank the ability to develop the real ability to do, uh, allocate more efficiently. But ironically, not ironically, but you know, on the <laughs> other hand, there's something developed out of China which is completely probably without the government doing anything about it. It is the emergence of technology, emergence of internet, emergence, because the traditional banking services are so inadequate, are horrendously inadequate, that the, you know, the new way of doing things, the new payment system, the new the Taobao's, the Tencent's, the everything else that essentially helped to digitalize China's entire economy. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, mm -hmm. the customers, most of the customers daily economic act activities are not really conducted through the banking system. Mm. They're conducted through the internet service platforms that are becoming massive ac accumulators of assets and increasingly become allocators of those assets. Mm. But without the regulation of reserves, capital adequacy, liquidity management regulation, so the, the, the central bank is finally waking up to it. Mm. The good thing is that they continue, as long as, as, soon as you become too big, you essentially get nationalized. Not nationalized, I, I don't want to create, use that word. Essentially becoming heavily regulated. But China may have the ability finally to combine the two together to say, okay, maybe the banks and these big platforms can create the regulation, the governance, start to get on that, the middle connectivity. Mm. And then maybe China will solve the problem. On the one hand, you have a great reliable depository base that never run on the bank. <laughs> and then you have a self-developed, privately owned, entrepreneurial spirited mm -hmm. DNA uh, you know, distribution and service platform and that the two could potentially connect to the government to put the efforts there that could solve that big problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the Hong, <laughs> Hong Kong will provide the in and out <laughs> system right. through this connect, which is really electronic trading, a settlement and clearing with individual banks, uh, individual markets. So essentially Stock Connect works this way. International investors are trading Chinese domestic equities through electronic routing of orders to, to Shanghai matching, but settlement and clear is in Hong Kong. So essentially, and the converse is true, Chinese investors investing into Hong Kong underlines, but electronically, but settlement and clear with China clear. So basically every day on the bridge in Shenzhen, mm. I'm the only one carry a bag of securities or, uh, uh, or cash, they, China clear carry a bag. We only settle the net of the two market on that day. So as a result, you have massive amount of trading, but after the net buying out, after the northbound and southbound connect, very little actually move, the, move across the border. So essentially, for example, the last four years, stock connect, there's net flow into China is only 100 billion RMB, but supported 1.3 trillion RMB worth of trading. So the leverage is massive. So my final word is essentially that connect. Before that, Three Gorges water is this high, 
ocean is this high, there's a big glass wall divided and called a capital control. Star Connect didn't really blow that away. They just lowered the glass wall five meters below the ocean, all the way to the bottom of the ocean is still the big wall. Yeah. <laughs> but on the top five meters of the ocean, water start to move. <laughs> so as a result, you know, all the price, all the engagement, all the you know, equity interests that are being swapped, what capital control maintained is not in and out. Okay. When you sell the securities on the other side, the money goes back to your account. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Mm. Uh, very clarifying vision. Governor Carney, I know you wanted to... Well, I mean, I think that's a magisterial description of what's going on in China and very important points made there. And I think uh, I'm sure we'll pick up, or hopefully we'll pick up more, what we can learn and import in terms of real fintech innovation from China that would... Uh, uh, would uh, provide better financing, uh, more inclusive financing, more efficient financing for small businesses, for individuals across all our economies. There's one bit of the financial sector, if I may, which might have been left out of that description given time, which is the bit that's near the banking system but isn't that innovative fintech world, which is, let's call it, you know, the wealth management trusts and the other uh, element, that, yeah, which is more an element of shadow banking. And the reason why I... I I think we, you know, we're familiar, Charles is familiar with it well. And this is the part of the system as well where, um, and, and the Chinese authorities are well aware of this and have been taking measures and, uh, and addressing it. But it's a, you know, these are substantial proportions of GDP in terms of assets mm -hmm. that don't have the rock solid uh, guarantee in terms of the liabilities, that uh, do have the exposures and have some echoes to some of the structures that grew up in the UK and the United States prior to the last financial crisis. And so the adjustment of those, what goes back on the bank balance sheet, where there are losses, what's worked out, is part of the adjustment there. It doesn't undercut the other two legs of the story, but it's a big element of the reform. But then, and I'll stop with this point, which then bring it back to what some of us mentioned, and, and you raised, Adam, which is, okay, so what does that tell us about the market-based finance system in the global economy yeah. uh, that has grown up quite substantially. And what are the lessons we may have taken from the crisis? Ha to what extent have we applied? Are there new risks? And a lot of this goes to the load-bearing capacity of those entities, whether they're mutual funds or USITs or pension funds or others. And a general characteristic of, well, a characteristic, just to, I'll put it on the table and then shut up, of $30 trillion of assets um, in the global economy um, is that they are daily liquidity to a mutual fund holder, to use an American term, or a USIT holder, European, um, and they are invested in what are actually quite illiquid assets, even in good times and very illiquid assets in difficult times. And what's that going to do to the propagation of risk? And one of the other questions we have as authorities, and it starts with securities regulators and others, is is there additional leverage in these, uh, in these entities yeah. that may uh, add to the dynamics? And that's one of the big issues in global finance at the moment. Deputy Governor Skingsley, would you share that assessment? You gave us a relatively sanguine account of the banking sector when things kicked off with the proviso that we shouldn't do backsliding. Mm -hmm. Is this move into uh, the non-bank uh, market-based finance? Mm -hmm. Systemic risk. Uh, well, we, we know that the financial ecosystem sort of evolves over time, and I think we are uh, living in, in a time in history where digitization, robotics, and, and artificial intelligence will probably be the most disruptive forces mm -hmm. that we will we will experience in our lifetime. And um, getting those uh, fantastic functions right uh, to good do good rather than evil is is um, is going to be uh, quite a challenge. And I think I think we're starting to see that there are different paths taking in different parts of the world. The data protection is, is is what I'm thinking about. This is not what you ask ask asked uh, about. I'm dodging your question a little mm -hmm. bit, as you can, as you can hear. <laughs> uh, but I I we, we you know we we just constantly had to to look at all these changes and and uh, you know maintain the kind of the core objective here, which is that. Financial industry, financial markets should be the shock absorbers rather than the shock amplifiers mm -hmm. and be prepared to speak with quite loud and high voices, not clear voices when we are seeing the opposite. Mm -hmm. This may be, I mean, uh, I want to move uh, as quickly as we can really to the, the general audience and give people a chance to pepper you with questions which you may find harder to evade than those coming from me. 
But a huge theme for Davos as a whole, as I'm a first timer here, I've been very struck by it, is this preoccupation with politics, essentially, with the question of populism, with the question of the malfunctioning of democracy. In the moment, the heat of the moment in 2008, 9, 10, there was a connection between issues of financial regulation, bank governance, the bank bailouts, and high stakes democratic politics. Is, is that link still there? Is this an issue that you see and that uh, preoccupies you as people involved in these kind of issues in whatever form? I had the sense that was there a certain elephant in the room earlier on uh, concerning at least one large democratic system. I, I, I can answer that one. Excellent. Uh, because I, 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 was a, I was a junior uh, research person in the trading room when the, 10 years ago. So I, I think I can, can talk about what happened then as an outsider and what I think is happening now. Uh, I think there was a tremendous political effort uh, putting in place in, uh, around the G20. And I think... <laughs> Uh, the fact that the crisis brings people together is, is certainly an example we are seeing there. Um, looking around now, uh, I don't see a surplus of political will no. to pre-commit to any kind of insurance systems whatsoever, besides what is already in place. Um, and from a small country perspective, which is my perspective here, um, the lesson I, I take from this is that we have to keep our own house in order and we cannot depend on the generosity of foreign taxpayers. Um, so uh, we, we take our steps. We have doubled the FX reserve uh, as one example uh, because we have a cross-border banking system yes. and we want to be ready to, if there is no swap line when uh, uh, the dunes day arrive, okay. we, we don't want to fall apart uh, at least the first week. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Japan may be a bit different from Europe as well as the United States because uh, we had a huge uh, financial crisis in 1990s. Yes. Uh, early 1990s, uh, the asset bubble bursted and uh, market financing as well as the banking system was seriously affected and a few uh, big banks as well as big uh, securities companies uh, disappeared and uh, the government uh, very much strengthened the financial uh, regulation over banks as well as, uh, as non-banks in late 1990s, early 2000. And yet, uh, the, this is my personal <laughs> assessment, but yet uh, the aftermath of big uh, financial crisis and bailing out of uh, financial institutions by governments and so on and so forth uh, made Japanese politics a bit unstable. As you may know, uh, we had a long history of uh, LDP-dominated uh, governments uh, for so many years. But then uh, there appeared some uh, non-LDP-led uh, uh, governments. And uh, in uh, about 10 years ago, we had uh, completely uh, non-LDP governments. Uh, I don't say purely populist, but uh, apparently uh, the 1990s uh, financial crisis, uh, government uh, bailing out activities, and then financial regulation strengthening and so on and so forth, had some impact on uh, general public and uh, m made uh, non-LDP-led governments. But now the LDP government came back and the political situation has somehow stabilized, like or not. Yeah. So I think uh, financial crisis uh, tends to create uh, not just financial economic problems, but also political uh, instability or political uh, problem. Uh, 
and uh, Japan has experienced uh, uh, this kind of situation many years ago uh, compared with Europe and, yeah. and US. That's a very interesting reminder of <laughs> sort of chronology that is almost entirely lost, I think, to the Western populism discussion. I, that's actually yeah. the first time I've ever heard Japan raised in that way. That's a fascinating. Governor? Uh, just very quickly, um, the two sort of small p political fallouts of the mm. crisis, mm. Uh, which stay with us and we need to keep, are, are around responsibility. So um, actually ending too big to fail, I think, you know, there's a huge bar on actually getting that done um, and that, uh, that the private sector, not just the shareholders, but uh, the debt holders management bear the consequences of mm. uh, f future uh, failures. Uh, it, it, you know, and a lot of work's been done. We're not all the way there yet, but a lot of work. And then secondly, individual responsibility of senior managers. Um, and one of the big issues in the UK was a perceived and you know, actual relatively limited consequences for the senior most people is also an issue in the US. Mm. And so the link for, and, and the response in the UK, and I'll stop with this, is a was so-called senior managers regime where it's clear who's responsible for what in terms of risk management and, and oversight. And uh, ignorance is not a defense. It will have if, if you have people who are doing the wrong thing and they haven't, they're, they're not being um, overseen, they haven't been trained, uh, uh, you, you don't take remedial action, it will have consequences for your compensation, it will have consequences for your uh, authorization, your uh, position at these firms. And then, of course, if it's more serious, then they'll be broader. And it's it, establishing that link. Uh, and, and this, I think, and on, on, on that, retaining that attitude and application over time as the memory of the crisis yes. fades, that will be one of the big tests of uh, the, the small p political reaction to this. Mm -hmm. And can I just press on that yeah. one point and then we'll go out to the floor. Are there, are there competitive consequences to that? I mean, if you establish yeah. a personal liability regime of that type, essentially we, the there, political system wants to send bankers to jail if this happens again, <laughs> for political reasons. Well, Will bankers continue to be bankers? Under those uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a total bluff. <laughs> it's a bluff. And, you know, they say other... I mean, and because it's also... It's about... Um, I mean, maybe not total bluff, maybe a few on the margin, mm -hmm. but effectively substantial deferred compensation, where it really hits is on deferred compensation yeah. and the ability for that to cool, be clawed but. back. Mm. Um, and there is a competitive element in different jurisdictions apply those rules differently, yeah. and some only apply them at home but not abroad. Uh, UK applies it globally, but um, I, in my view, uh, it's, it's absolutely necessary for the social license of the industry. Um, and uh, in the end, there hasn't been a deterioration in the quality of the bankers. David and Charles just yeah. want to come in briefly, and then we'll go out to the mm. Yeah, I, I agree with all of what's been said, but I think we mm. shouldn't underestimate how much of a legacy there may be mm. from yeah. uh, the crisis, that people were hurt, mm. and they are a bit less impressed than we are by the fact that we did a cleanup mm. afterwards, <laughs> yeah. and that we think we understand clearly the counterfactual, that if we hadn't bailed out the banks, things would have been worse. It's not mm. a very easy argument mm. to, to get across. So. Mm. I fear that the next time, if, if any time soon, there is a, a worse than a garden variety recession, but really something that um, involves financial stresses and strains, or what I suspect is more likely, that we've strengthened the banking system and the next downturn is more about a collapse of asset prices, risk residing much more with the household, the investor, um, the, uh, uh, the pension fund, or uh, you know, things that will affect ordinary people, that there will again be uh, anger. And the way it will manifest itself is in limitations on the ways in which governments can respond. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Mark is right in, in, in response to that in, in, in a way to point out that we really have to make sure that the too big to fail provisions work. But many people think that in a, in a, in a, in a substantial crisis, um, we, we, we might well again need central banks to act in an extraordinary way, whether it's in terms of monetary policy or in ways in which the Fed intervened to uh, deal with the collapse of certain capital market segments. Those kinds of actions required fiscal backstops from the U.S. Treasury. I think there are an analogous possibilities in other countries. And while in the end of the day, taxpayers may 
come to see the wisdom of doing that. My guess is that at the beginning there'll be a great reluctance. Yes. If you think in the international setting, uh, when there was dollar shortage, the Fed provided a trillion dollars worth of swap lines around the world. I'm sure they'll continue swap lines uh, to the central banks here on the stage. But, but I wonder whether they'll be politically able and, and, and would, would feel comfortable mm. extending swap lines as broadly as they did last time because the political environment for uh, the Fed has, has changed substantially. So I think we should be aware that the, in a way the, the politics of this may make, uh, may contribute to the limitation of, 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 respons of, of responsiveness, which to my mind really means from a policy standpoint, let's be a lot more careful to mm -hmm. sustain growth, not to have unforced errors, not to sc let squabbles lead to uh, problems and to do whatever we can to make sure that the next recession when it comes is a garden variety recession. And that point about the tension between the remit of the swap lines and the realm of the banks that might have to be covered presumably is amplified by the globalization of banking and the fact that a wider set of EMs would actually be in line. Charles, I know you wanted to come in. Yeah, I want to contrast the philosophical differences in approaching those issues uh, between politics and economics. Uh, clearly the West uh, you know, the, the, the working assumption is the market works, the market is the perfect place to ultimately generate the right result. Then the politics is about how to distribute that, uh, the outcome of that market production, whether through taxes, you know, who, where what we collect the tax from, and where we redistribute the tax, uh, you know, and into on the government spending. But the broader assumption is the market works, let the market work, and then we distribute. We figure out how the politics is all about how to distribute and, you know, the winnings. And uh, obviously, we're now eating the, uh, uh, the fruits of that assumption because the market, the bankers, you know, have not really worked as well as we all think they would have. So China started from the other side. It says, okay, the market is not really working. Actually planning, you know, early planning, Bought top to top down is the better way of doing things. So that we don't really waste resources. We can plan everything better. That assumption obviously led to a much more of an SOE-driven economy, and that obviously, you know, with the four trillion, with everything else, that China <coughs> today still struggling with how to find a way to actually let the market force it to play a role in distributing these resources. So at the end of the day. China is probably in a better position because philosophically, you in the West will find it's very hard to move back to that left. But actually China can actually move from the left to the right. Because the right thing is not about whether the market works perfectly or whether the planning works perfectly. The point is central plan works to somewhere and then stop working. And you know, when you build a bridge, when you build a major highway, sometimes you need to move a few families away. And as long as you properly compensate that, that should not frustrate development. But on the other hand, if the SOE is monopolizing on all the resources, then we're going to see all the problems that we are seeing in China. Hopefully China will be able to move, because at least they do recognize the market works. But the problem is you never recognize the government works. So you know, we see how that two travel is going to interact. Fascinating how we move from mm. technical issues to really fundamental philosophical divides on political economy. Um, can I ask the audience for questions? Perhaps if you could identify yourself, uh, the mic will be coming your way. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mohammed El Kuwais. I'm the chairman of the Capital Market Authority, uh, the capital market regulator of Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is a very insightful discussion. Um, I noticed a lot of the focus in uh, financial infrastructure revolved around prudential uh, side and the financial stability side. And I just wanted to turn the uh, uh, discussion, if, if, if I may, to the conduct uh, side of the financial profession. Uh, and, and if I may use just a, a quick analogy, uh, a, 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 another industry, the uh, medical industry, is now quite established with licensing requirements for practitioners, with product liability for uh, things like uh, uh, mistreatment and misdiagnosis. A and it seems that the financial sector, in spite of the fact that it is today much larger, uh, uh, doesn't have 
the same level of uh, uh, licensing requirements and product liability. And I was wondering if there was any uh, talk or any discussion about moving in that direction. Thank you. Does anyone want to respond? Well, I'll start. Um, uh, you're right, the analogy doesn't work perfectly. The uh, product liability, if you will, um, consequences of uh, financial malfeasance uh, are north of uh, uh, $325 billion uh, since, uh, since the crisis. That's the, that's the running, and I, I, I don't think I'm actually giving you the up-to-date figure. These are the fines. Or These the are the fines and the settlements of various institutions mm. and various jurisdictions, the bulk of which is paid in the U.S., but global institutions and mm. some who else. So there's, first there's that. Mm. Uh, I'll just observe that. So, and actually, it's of an order of magnitude that it spills into financial stability. I mean, that's when you know you really had misconduct is when it comes to the financial stability. First point. Second, uh, talk briefly about... Um, uh, senior managers regime and compensation uh, scheme. Senior, senior management of these institutions are now deferring. They have 70% plus of their compensation held back. It's called a bonus, but it's held back. And in the UK, it's held back up to seven years, but can be extended to 10 if subsequent malfeasance or potential malfeasance is discovered. So that's, you know, that's, that's some liability that's there. Now, it's not a perfect analogy, but that type of thinking has come in. Last point is that, and it's not the same level of um, qualification to become a surgeon or a medical practitioner, um, but uh, the qualifications have been tightened. And what, again, has been done, I can speak for the UK, is that um, there is a certification regime that is now required for the senior professionals. And it, it's different in different jurisdictions, different legal professions, or traditions, I should say. But in the UK, your record follows you. So if you, it, there's none of this, um, Something goes wrong, and you're quietly, um, you're quietly uh, that you agree to leave your firm, and then the reference is a clean reference, and nobody knows, and you get this sort of rolling bad apple uh, situation, which we used to have in the past. I understand, I respect. It, it's very hard to do that in the U.S. with their legal tradition, but it, it. So there have been some significant changes. I wouldn't say it's medical esque, but it's moved uh, in that direction. Can I just mm -hmm. ask Mark? Actually, yeah. I presume that. Uh, you, the, the supervisors and regulators have the prerogative if they think that a very senior manager is, uh, in the course of reviewing the bank, uh, that a, a very senior manager is not up to the job yeah. to, to deal with that. And we do, yeah, fit and proper. And so well, that's, that's, that's one an of analog, the next levels. That's an analogous yeah. uh, control that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important. I mean, you don't want to do that just to prove you can do that, but it's mm -hmm. important that it's done in the right, in the right circumstances, yeah. Gentleman here on the on the edge on the yeah. Hello, Fernando from Bradesco. I'm the chief economist there. Let me just put a narrative here and see if you agree on that. So, uh, the regulation of 2008 uh, partially is responsible for the low growth of credit after that. Uh, in parallel, fintechs uh, boomed everywhere. Just not only because of the regulation of the banking system, they are finding a, a way, but also because of technology. Uh, and my question is, aren't we creating a kind of uh, regulatory arbitrage on that? Uh, to the extent that these fintechs will create some risk that by the end of the day is exactly the origin of the, the things we try to solve in 2008 crisis because they are not regulated, they are replacing part of the banks, so competition is definitely uh, important, but by the end of the day we are uh, bringing credit from banks to fintechs to some extent and this can create the sort of crisis that was uh, the origin in 2008. Just to see how it wrapped. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's not, it's not the, the tax <laughs> driver complaint about Uber, okay? So the, just, just to let it know. Yeah, I think this uh, issue has been very much discussed in yeah. recent days. Um, Chinese example may be a bit of uh, exception in the banking sector and <coughs> new fintech or what uh, now people say big tech like uh, Alipay or Tencent. Um, in the future, some uh, cooperation, uh, coordination, or even merger of the two sides may create uh, good, efficient uh, financial system. But in the US, Europe, and Japan, um, now those big tech companies are making 
we, we, we tend to think that uh, these uh, big tech companies uh, are making disruptive impact on the banking sector. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, many uh, countries, uh, they are trying to change uh, financial regulation from uh, those based on institutions to based on activities. But even then, still big tech companies specialized uh, in uh, payment and settlement, not uh, taking deposit and uh, lending money and so on and so forth, may disrupt the banking sector in a serious way. So how to deal with this situation? That is a very difficult question. In some sense, uh, I mean, I, I, again, <laughs> this is my personal assessment. Nowadays, commercial banks are not only commercial banks, but also uh, many of them are investment banks, asset managers, uh, trust banks, and so on and so forth. So those banks have uh, sort of uh, economy of, sp of scope uh, kind of uh, uh, ad ad uh, advantage. On the other hand, those big tech companies are enjoying sort of uh, economy of scale, huge scale, specialized in small, narrow uh, range of uh, financial service. And whether this uh, economy of scale and economy of, sco uh, sc sc economy of sc scope and economy of scale, which would uh, dominate and how to deal with this situation, I think this is going to be a very challenging uh, uh, issue for uh, regulators. Yeah. Charles, do you want to? Yeah, I think the big lesson in China today about fintech, uh, you know, is really a big difference between the big platforms and the thousands of uh, P2P small fintech or alleged mm -hmm. fintech mm -hmm. in China. The problem with that second category mm -hmm. in China today, which probably is not prevalent in the West, is that in China today, and in the West, it's very hard for anybody to actually talk you into giving you, giving you $100,000 to some you know, strangers to deal with it. But in China, just a massive amount of depositors who have no real opportunity to really invest their money in a profitable manner. And as, as long as you have any license from anybody of authority, the population essentially saying the government is going to have to be behind it. So therefore, it is so easy for thousands of these little fintechs, you know, essentially developing into, you know, schemes to collect the depositors' money, very quickly become Ponzi games, and on massive scales, they all fail. And the government has to be really cracked down because you essentially are banking, or essentially you're stealing on sovereign guarantee rent, and the government has to really put a stop to it. And ultimately, I think what they will have to do is to regulate it so that they have no direct access to depositors, and they have to have some sort of intermediary in the middle. Re, you know, instead of a disintermediation, they have to find a way to intermediate it. And, uh, but they just need to really find the right channel so the money can actually find productive ways to make an investment without having to go through all the bandits. And uh, so that's really the challenge China faces. I want to suggest that we think about this a little bit differently. Your question is fundamentally about whether the uh, financial regulatory system can deal with the migration of risk yeah. and yeah. with um, mm. uh, arbitrage. You know, I think we learned in the crisis where, the, in, say, in the United States, where the definition of the regulatory perimeter was very narrowly defined, that all of a sudden key regulators couldn't do anything about certain very big investment banks because they weren't inside the circle. In principle, the reforms that have happened have basically said if you pose a risk to stability, you can be regulated. So in the first instance, shortly after the uh, crisis, as because the, 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 the FINREG really did tighten things up, when there were migrations of risk, the, 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 the system, everyone took a very, very close look at the non-banks to see if they could, f if they found 
uh, activity that involve maturity or liquidity transformation where there should be, uh, and, and in a setting where it, it caused systemic risk. Now, I think this has been successful enough in the U.S. that U.S. tech companies know that if they cross the boundary, they're going to be regulated. This is why Amazon <laughs> is not like, <laughs> like Ali, Alipay or, or, or Tencent. So it actually works, and the system has, has thought about this. That doesn't mean that there won't be some um, innovative approaches that, at least for a while, uh, you know, it, it doesn't quack enough like a duck for everyone to call it a duck, and so for a while there's an issue. But I think that, that conceptually this isn't a problem. It's that it practically it may remain a problem. And I, if you bring Charles' point in, the, the macro financial context matters. Mm -hmm. Under conditions of financial repression, the regulatory problem is far more severe. Yeah, because, because China, when they want to fix it, will fix it. There's no Congress to, to regulate. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Flanders. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Flanders from Bloomberg Economics. Um, the test of the system's financial resilience that at least you would hope to be facing, that we sort of know about in the next few years, is the remo <coughs> removal of the extraordinary monetary stimulus that we've had since the crisis. The central bankers on the panel have, have barely begun that process, but we've had the Fed proceed with probably historically the most gradual, mm. best <laughs> telegraphed <laughs> yeah. increase in rates that we've ever seen in central banking. Mm. And yet, in recent months, we saw significant market reaction to that. And here in Davos, mm. uh, perhaps most strikingly, you know, senior members of the global financial community effectively mm. agreeing with Donald Trump that the Fed had gone too far, too fast. Do you look at that and say, blimey, the system is even less ready for slightly more normal rates than I thought? Um, I'll, I'll start off. Um, if you look at the Fed tightening and uh, what's happened to uh, advanced economy financial conditions, and there's various ways to measure financial conditions, um, but broad brush, uh, and apologies for being slightly technical, but um, they have moved about 0.6 of a standard deviation on financial conditions, aggregate advanced economy uh, FCI, in this tightening cycle with the sell-off at, at the sort of peak of the sell-off uh, in December. That's what happened in the 2004-2006 tightening cycle. Um, it's a little less than happened in the previous uh, Fed tightening cycle, but it's order of magnitude. What happened, actually, was it took a while, you know, uh, conditions loosened um, partially because of uh, arguably uh, fiscal stimulus, partially, I mean, other factors you can describe to other factors. Changes. But, but uh, the, the overall financial conditions loosened for a period, and then you had a sharper, a sharper move. So that's the first point. So I think a bit of context, and I know it's all recent, you know, ruined a few people's uh, holidays and things like that, but let's put it in, let's put it in context. Um, the second thing is that we're operating in a system, uh, and we've all said this in different ways, and, you know, it, you can't be overly precise about it, but there are a variety of big structural reasons, as you know, Stephanie, that um, I think you would agree broad brush with this, that uh, equilibrium interest rates are lower than they were in the past. So the Fed moving, um, and, and, and I obviously don't speak for the Fed, but trying to uh, just assume I can exert, uh, uh, insert exactly the way they phrase this, um, but that uh, they've moved uh, towards the region of where our store, the equilibrium interest rate, the lower end of the region of where it may be, which is revealed by their dot plots. So now I am getting really techy, but whatever. Um, you got to be careful with this stuff. So you know they're saying they're getting in the region, which means that they've moved possibly towards where neutral is, and then it becomes a finely balanced or data-driven judgment about where neutral is and where they might go. Okay, that's that's a you know in many respects, given the the given the the different structural circumstance of lower overall equilibrium interest rates, that's that that's kind of a normal tightening uh, cycle and. You know, we'll see what happens with the strength of the global economy, U.S. economy, inflation dynamics, and they'll adjust accordingly, and the rest of us will adjust. So I, I, I'd, I'd offer that up in terms of broader context. Anyone else want to take well, that? I'd just like to say that it might be a bit unfair to, uh, to uh, blame the Federal Reserve for all that we have seen in the markets in, in recent <laughs> months. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, but I would also like to say we did a first hike in seven years just before Christmas. We had spent the previous 18 months talking about and also forecasting that we would do a first hike uh, in the second half of 2018. 
and it went swimmingly. So it can it can work. And if there's a sell-off in the Swedish markets, that's that will be because other reasons that the central bank has, has been uh, been at play. That's my view. I have a very just short comment. I think if you wind <laughs> back the clock, and you look at the kinds of worries that there were about normalization when it started, we should conclude that it's gone rather well. And given Mark's point that, you know, if you think about previous cycles where they were more garden variety and everyone thought at least were pretty sure they knew where you were going to end up at the next uh, peak, here there is a lot of uncertainty about the extent to which the end point has changed. And I think given all of that, I think it's uh, actually rather uh, uh, a, 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 a pretty good outcome so far. Mm. Um, you know, time will time will tell, but I think it's 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 been better than than most people expected. Can I bundle two last questions? The gentleman with a beautiful green tie, and then the gentleman <laughs> who, along with a dark tie. <laughs> I hope the question is also beautiful. Um, my name is Zaya, and um, I, I have to, uh, to admit that I'm not a financial expert by any chance, but I'm a technologist. So I would like to hear the role of a cryptocurrency in the disrupting uh, the banking sector. And I'm not referring here to the, big, uh, to the big tech, like Alibaba or something like this, because at the end of the day, those big techs are bankables, where the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain industry is actually totally transparent from the whole banking industry and borderless. And the gentleman along the right, if you could keep your question brief, that would be good. Hi, my name is Michael Itzer from the ICAW. I'd like to return to some of the introductory panel remarks about operational issues. Do any of the panel feel that the migration of many financial services businesses to cloud-based uh, storage solutions is actually creating a systemic risk for the future? Oh, we've come back to the operational technical stuff that Mark in particular was. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think I didn't think I'd actually get a question about well, it. Well, you enough just to <laughs> scare off. That's me to please. Come to um, the um, so why don't I start very quickly on cloud? Um, look, there hasn't been that much uh, that's migrated that is um, core or critical services that's migrated to cloud yet. Um, but actually, one of the judgments is going to be about whether migration of some of those services actually makes the system more systemic and the and and the ability both to uh, go into a cloud and have the ability to move into another cloud. So there's a, there, there, there is a process underway that it will determine. A cloud is part of the solution, but it's going to have to be done proper, you know, right for the financial sector. And you know what, tech company, financial sector is different. Um, it has different um, amplification mechanisms. We have different specs and standards. We have different expectations in terms of in terms of portability and, and switchability, if I can put it that way. Um, and so uh, it'll get there and it'll be part of the solution. Uh, very uh, quickly on crypto, it's not going to disrupt because uh, they're not cryptocurrencies. They're at best crypto assets, but they're really um, not going anywhere. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, uh, Makani in the sense that uh, so called cryptocurrency uh, has not been uh, performing uh, as a currency. Its, uh, it's uh, <coughs> value fluctuates so widely and uh, not uh, used, uh, not very much used for uh, uh, payment and, and so on and so forth. It's, uh, it's a subject of uh, pure uh, speculation or something. On the other hand, the, the, the technology, uh, DLT or distributed ledger technology, which created uh, uh, cryptocurrency, that technology is, is not the same as the, 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 the cryptocurrency. And the technology itself could be used uh, for uh, more productive purposes. And actually, Bank of Japan and the ECB uh, have uh, uh, been experimenting uh, use of uh, DLT for uh, uh, financial transactions and so on. And we found that uh, DLT could be useful for some purpose uh, in financial uh, uh, transactions and financial uh, 
uh, system. Thank you. As a historian, I tend to think we'll look back on the cryptocurrency episode as a particularly bizarre hybrid born out of libertarian conservative disgust at fiat money, <laughs> which goes all the way back to the early 70s, combined with the toxic side effects of heavily subsidized coal-fueled electric power generation <laughs> in China, which is a kind of uh, a dystopian nightmare of the early 21st century. Um, uh, uh, but uh, so I, I'm delighted to hear that central bankers pushing back so hard against this, this bubble. Uh, altogether, I think it's been a fantastic panel. Thank you very much Thank you for much. such an interesting <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.